this is Sarah Novke. Hey, this is Samuel Peralta. And- hey, this is Andy Pelliquin. This is M.A. Phipps, and you're listening to 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston, Preston Lay. Lay. Woohoo! Hey, everybody. We do have a giveaway with this episode with Lyndon Perry. But first, I want to tell you about our sponsors. First up is Cereal Box. Serial Box delivers exciting episodes of ongoing stories straight to your device every Wednesday. They bring everything that's awesome about TV to what's already cool about books with addicting serials you can take with you on the go. All of their episodes are available in text and audio, and their sleek app makes reading easier than ever. They have a range of titles from gritty urban thrillers to sexy sword fighting fantasies and everything in between. Season 2 of The Witch Who Came In From The Cold just started up. The Witch Who Came In From The Cold, all the subterfuge of the Americans with a dark dose of magic. Head on over to SerialBox.com where you can read and listen to it now. And of course, the first episode of Season 1 is free so you can check it out there. SerialBox.com S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X dot com. Our second sponsor this week is the Galactic Satori Chronicles, written by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. A thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline-pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancé's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. In a desire to better understand humans in order to destroy them, these aliens are projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, and in the process are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Fueled by emotions that the aliens will never understand, Asher bands together with a group of friends. These four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Asher takes the fight from Earth to an alien spaceship and then to the very planet of the enemy trying to destroy them. Galactic Story Chronicles can be found on Amazon, where Book 1 Earth and Book 2 Kron are only 99 cents. And now for the giveaway. Lyndon Perry is giving three people the chance to pick any of his stories in ebook format, and anybody that signs up for his newsletter can receive an ebook copy of any of his short stories. Just let him know that you signed up because of this interview. In order to get registered, head on over to the show notes and let us know what is your favorite part of this interview. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Our guest this week is uh, Lyndon Perry. Thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Not a problem. Um, Well, here at uh, 30 minute author interviews. Uh, we like to start each episode with a segment we call two truths and a lie. I am, uh, on a one correct guessing streak. I, I think it's one, maybe two, but I know one. Um, do you happen to have two truths and a lie about yourself that I can try to guess? Yeah, we'll give it a shot. Okay. Uh, the first one is I was named after Lyndon B. Johnson, the president, when I was born. Gives a little hint on my age, if that's true. <laughs> I uh, spent a year in uh, in Australia uh, as a foreign exchange student, and I shaved my head as uh, Daddy Warbucks in uh, a musical. Wow. So I hope the Australian one is true because that would be pretty cool. So I'm going to narrow it down to your name or shaving your head for a play. Um, dang, that's that's for some reason. No, there's really no reason at all. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna say the lie is being named. After Lyndon Johnson. Well, that's that's pretty clever because most people, I mean, that's my name. Lyndon spelled exactly like Lyndon Johnson. And he was president when I was born just about a month. I was born right after Kennedy was assassinated. But I was actually named for a family friend whose name was Lyndon, uh, who lives in Australia. Oh, does he? 
Yeah. And so when I went to Australia as a foreign exchange student in high school, uh, of course, I caught up with my namesake and uh, and had a great time. That is awesome. Um, so the reason why I was hoping the Australian thing was true, um, when you were there, I, I don't know how long it's been going on, I assume for a while. Did you ever go to any Aussie rules football games? Yeah, yeah, I did. It's, I, uh, that it's crazy. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's I, nuts. I had somebody introduce me to it um, about was it six years ago? Mm -hmm. There was a a store when I lived in Charleston, South Carolina that sold uh, soccer jerseys and uh, soccer equipment, rugby equipment and stuff like that. And I would go in there when my wife was working and just hang out. Uh, He he always had soccer or rugby on television. And Mm -hmm. one day he had Aussie rules football on and I sat down and watched it with him. And he just explained the game to me as we were watching it. And that is one of the most insane sports I have ever watched. (laughs) Yeah, it is pretty insane, but you want to pronounce it Aussie rules. Aussie uh, rules, okay. Yeah, it's not Aussie. That's American there pronunciation. Go. Aussie there. rules. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's what did did you did you go to any of the games or did you just kind of watch? Yeah, I went to one. Went to one Aussie game. How's, Aussie rules football. How's the uh, crowd during those games? It's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty rowdy. Crowd. I mean. Yeah, this was back when you could bring you know beer bottles in mm-hmm. to the stadium and and man when. Uh, got rowdy. We, uh, you know, you had to duck because people from the uh, higher up in the in the crowd and the stands would be throwing beer bottles, and you might get hit. Wow, that's funny. It for those that, like I said, just just look it up, watch some of the highlights. It is a very fun game to watch. Um, it's not too complicated, but it's a, no, it's fun. It's, it's a fun fast game. paced, very fast paced. High can get very high scoring too, but it is a. Uh, Man, it is full contact. <laughs> yep. So, um, so is there any funny story with you having to shave your head? Like, did you have to shave your head for that role that you played? No, or did I, you I guess I didn't to have to, but yeah, I was I was a pastor actually at the time too. So, uh, preached from the pulpit uh, the next Sunday in a uh, with a bald head. I should have <laughs> preached uh, should have preached a sermon on Elijah. It could have been a first person, <laughs> right? But. Uh, <laughs> No, it's just uh, the role, and I had fun with it. Okay. Um, well, for, for those of my listeners that might not know who you are or what you do, why don't you kind of give them an intro on who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, I'm a pastor, husband, father. Uh, I herd cats. Uh, not really. They, they own the house, so I can't really herd them anywhere. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, coffee drinker, part-time writer. I uh, was taught middle school English for five years and uh, you know, just, yeah, more of a hobbyist right now with my indie publishing. Oh, okay. So you used to teach English. Um, what what grade did you teach? Yeah, sixth grade language sixth grade. arts. Okay. That's that's pretty cool. Well, for those that don't know, um, and you, you might have to correct me because I'll probably get my wording wrong. You were... Was it in the first group of people that wrote in the wool universe? Yeah. You know, before there was uh, Kindle Worlds, um, the, the reason Kindle Worlds started was people like uh, Hugh Howey and uh, Joe Conrath uh, were opening up their, their um, uh, you know, pr- uh, commodities, their uh, intellectual property to uh, fans to write in their worlds. And uh, there was always a question then of legality, like, well, how, you know, if we take their characters or their setting, you know, who owns the copyright to that? And and Hugh Howey, as far as I understand, wasn't really concerned about that because he understood that the more people wrote, the more excitement there was and and the better it off, better it was for everyone. Um, And so there was a wave of maybe, I don't know, five or six writers who uh, were able to publish in the wool universe before the Kindle World's. Uh, system got started. And I don't know how many are still in that, but now, you know, anyone who wants to write wool fanfic has to go through Kindle Worlds. Uh, and I still have my story. I only wrote one, but I still have my story outside the Kindle Worlds um, system. And uh, some others rewrote it or repackaged it and put it back into Kindle Worlds. But like I said, I don't know how many of the original fanfic uh, stories are outside the Kindle Worlds system, but, but I was one of the first five or six writers. 
That's awesome. So is um, is Wool and Hugh Howie how you got introduced to indie writing, or did you get introduced to indie writing another way? Uh, no, I actually started a magazine uh, back in oh the Lulu Publishing days, uh, two thousand four, two thousand five through two thousand seven, and uh, a print magazine did an anthology, and um, and then you know you started getting a, a few things. Uh, electronic publishing PDF was the way, you know, the way we distributed stories. Okay. Uh, and you had to sit at your computer, of course, and read, you know, the story on computer, which wasn't very mobile. Um, and, uh, so yeah, but when that, when that wave started taking over in 2009, 2010 with the Kindle, uh, there was a lot of interest and I, I, um, experimented with it. I just didn't stick with it, which is sort of the bane of my existence. I, I sort of dabble in the first few things of, uh, things to come and don't stick it through. And, and, uh, the wave passes me by maybe, I don't know. Right. Um, what's, so what's the first, first story that you self published? Uh, I've taken it down now. I mean, just, just some short stories, a collection of short stories when, you know, you could, put up a, a 2000 word short story or a collection like that and sell it for 99 cents. And I think I sold one or two and it had a horrible cover. And so I just, you know, that was just an experiment, just trying to figure out how to do it. And that was probably again, 2011 or 12. Okay. Um, what was it about Hugh Howie's wool, um, that just made you really want to write a story in it? Um, yeah, I don't know. Just I liked his style. I'd uh, he had contacted me when he was distributing the stories for Molly Fide, you know, her his uh, science fiction um, series, sort of young adult. And this was again probably 2010, I think. I don't know. And I did a review of that on my blog, and and sort of kept in contact with him. And when uh, Wool came out, uh, it, you know, he I was there sort of watching him marvel at all of a sudden it's starting to sell, you know, 10 a day, then, a, then 50 a day, then a hundred a day, then a thousand a day. And, um, and I, and he mentioned someone else was writing a story and I thought, Oh, well that sounds cool. Can I do that? Sure. And, um, so I read the story and just basically did a homage to it. It's not, I didn't take off. I didn't, uh, do anything fundamentally different than what he had done. Uh, but it was for, again, an experiment for me to see if I could write in someone else's world. Okay. Um, and that is, is, um, is that the last prayer? Yes. The story. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. for, for those that don't know, like what that story is about, can you give the kind of non-spoiler book blurb on what that story is about? Yeah, it's, um, so I don't want to spoil the story of wool, but there's this idea that, uh, the um, outside world uh, in a post-apocalyptic uh, scenario is very deadly. And uh, in my story, there's a young girl who has a vision, dreams of a um, paradise beyond the silo. And um, and then she's accused of heresy. And I introduce a uh, sort of a pastoral, uh, you know, sort of a system of priests. Now, Hugh Howey actually... Uh, has priests in his original story as well. And uh, one of my, one of the complaints, uh, you know, with fan fiction was someone reviewed and says, oh, this was, this isn't uh, uh, true to the original because Hugh doesn't have any, you know, doesn't use the religious aspect. And I'm going, well, you didn't read his story then (laughs) because, (laughs) you know, I mean, it's just sort of, so I I focused on that, uh, the sort of the religious aspect and uh, and then this this idea that this little girl is um, uh, has a vision of something beyond the silo. Okay, um, and one of the fan questions we have um, about that is from Chris Freed, and he says he would love to know whether you will ever write a follow up to your story, The Last Prayer. Yeah, I, I should have right when I wrote the first one. Um, I'm about halfway through it and have not looked at it for six years. Oh wow, really? Yeah. So it, has, has maybe been, I should. Has it been just other stories that have come up that made you want to write those over that? Uh, one? I don't know. It's just part of my, uh, I start something and then just hit a block and for whatever reason, uh, don't 
don't finish it. And this is, this is not anything, you know, you don't want to model your writing after my <laughs> <laughs> example here. It's just a, uh, it's a personal hangup. I, I really struggle with uh, starting I get through a couple of stories and, um, and then I should finish that third one uh, to wrap it all up. And I don't. Right. Okay. Um, now, for those that don't know, wool, uh, Hugh Howie's wool is made up of three books, wool, shift and dust. Um, which of those books do they need to read uh, to be able to understand yours? Or do they not really need to read any of them to understand your story? I don't think they need to read any of it. I think the, the concept is right there. But, you know, wool, even just the first story in wool would be uh, enough to understand the whole the whole concept because wool was a series of what was it five five books five novellas yeah uh, I think so. interconnecting stories so if you read just the first story in wool then you would understand the scenario okay and who who did your cover for the last prayer because it is an awesome cover uh you know that's actually a stock uh cover i got from um a artist named uh carissa and i lost contact with this person but uh, she has done uh, work, you know, just does, um, what do you call them, uh, pre-made covers. And I saw a set like that and I thought, oh, that fits my story. So I, uh, I bought three in anticipation of writing three stories, but I've only used the first cover. Oh, okay. Well, you'll have so, to... yeah, maybe if people insist that I write a second one and a third one, I, w- I guess I should. Yeah, there you go. You got, you've got the covers. You might as well. <laughs> That's right. Um. So another one of your your stories that you're kind of known for is Ma Tut's Donut Hut. Yeah, um, completely different genre. Yeah, completely different genre. Um, we'll, uh, we'll probably hopefully get to it here in a few minutes, but you ended up writing a story with Will Swordstrom, and yeah. uh, he wrote a, a post about it. Um, about your collaboration and he he said that your stories run the gamut from horror to sci-fi to young adult to cozy mysteries yeah. um and he, he actually says that ma tut's donut hut is possibly one of your your best stories that you've written um yeah. so before we get into it's it it's my best seller that's for sure is it really yeah yeah um what is the little you know the non-spoiler book blurb on that story yeah, well, you know, uh, Ma Tut is a retired lady. She's opening a donut shop uh, in a small, cozy town in Northern California, up in the mountains near Yosemite. And uh, she inherits uh, a magical cat uh, who uh, helps her get out of a few scrapes uh, that she finds uh, herself into, gets herself into with uh, some magical spices. So it's very whimsical. It's not Miss Marple at all. Someone compared it to, uh, you know, you know, said, well, this is no Miss Marple. Well, no, it's not. It's not even meant to be uh, Agatha Christie. My inspiration was more um, Lillian Jackson Brown. Do you know uh, that name? I do with, not. Uh, oh, her two characters are Coco and Yum Yum, and uh, his main character is Quiller. Her main qu- character is Quillerin, and uh, it's the Cat Who series. The Cat Who uh, plays uh, Shakespeare. The cat, the Cat Who, you know, reads backwards, etc. Okay. And so my inspiration is more. From uh, from Coco, who is a very intuitive cat, not magical, but very intuitive, and I sort I took it to the next level and have a have more of a magical cat in my in my silly uh, in my silly novel. Okay, um, so do you remember where you were when you got the idea for this novel or story? And then um, yeah, yeah. Let's just go with that. Yeah, I, I just finished um, uh, an online course with Dean Wesley Smith. I, I, do you know who he is? Um, he writes. Uh, he's written fan fiction when it was legal to do it. Uh, he was a Star Trek writer. Uh, you know all of those back in the '90s and 2000s. And uh, the course was on uh, on ideas. And his point is that ideas are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. And basically, you take the concept. I'm I'm really simplifying it, but you take the you take an idea, uh, you have a setting, and you have characters, and then you have um, uh, uh, some sort of conflict or something that's uh, some sort of issue that needs to be resolved. And that's that's the idea. I mean, you, they're not you can't protect them. There's just too many of them. And so I thought, well, that sounds good. So I was at Krispy Kreme Donut, and I said, there well, we what go. if I wrote a story about you know. A, Krispy Kreme donut, you know, and, and here I, and I like cats. I have two cats of my own and, and, uh, I was in the restaurant. My dad was in a restaurant business. So I put all three together and, and there it is. <laughs> That's funny. 
Well, for the big important question, Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I guess Dunkin' Donuts for the cake okay. and Krispy <laughs> Kreme for the, the hot sugar fluff. There we go. Yeah, I've always been a huge fan of, of Krispy Kreme. Unfortunately, <laughs> we live in the middle of nowhere, and so the closest Krispy Kreme is like two hours from our house. So, uh-huh. but yeah, there's nothing better than a Krispy Kreme when it's just coming when, when they right. have their hot fresh now on there, there's nothing, nothing better than a Krispy that's Kreme right. donut. You um, just go in line, get the free one and then leave. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I remember, man, and, uh, when we had one like five minutes from our house, they had a day where it was like, buy a dozen, get a dozen for a penny, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Or get a dozen for free or something. And we went to do this and the line was out the door when we got there. I think we had to wait like 20 minutes to get our donuts, but man, it's so worth it. (laughs) So (laughs) worth it. (laughs) Chris wants to know with your um, magical uh, cat series, when we might see another book. Well, I'm about halfway through that second (laughs) book as well. Uh, I just need to sit down and write. Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, you know, maybe this year, hopefully this summer. Okay. So where does your inspiration or where do you get inspiration for your stories? Because like, like Will said, your, your stories don't, aren't really one, you know, you're not known for, I guess, no. one genre. You write all over the place. Um, I do. And that's, I, for me, that's just, that's, I enjoy that. I don't, I don't want to be tied down to one genre. Um, uh, whatever. So whatever is of interest, whatever I'm reading, whatever strikes me. And again, it goes back to this idea, you know, the, the ideas are a dime a dozen. Uh, I'm not worried that this idea isn't very um, original. There, there aren't any original ideas. You just uh, a character in a setting with a problem. And so any any character in a setting with a problem gives rise to some sort of story. And it's what you do with that, of course, that makes the story good or bad uh, or readable or unreadable. Uh, but if you think about it, almost every every short story you read, every novel, it, it begins. It, there's an opening hook where you have some characters in a setting with some sort of issue that needs to be resolved. Otherwise, you're not going to move forward in finishing the story. It's not going to be of interest unless you like plotless stories. There are stories that don't have plot and those are uh, in and of themselves uh, its own, its own thing. And, but most of us write with an idea of a, of a, a resolution that we have to uh, reach a climax to, to, uh, to reach. And then, uh, um, then would be satisfied with the ending of the story. Do you have one genre that you like writing in more than others? Uh, no, I don't think so. Just whatever, again, whatever strikes my fancy. Okay. Now how about, reading is, is there certain genres you do you, you like to read more or do you read all over the place i i read all over the place right now i'm reading a lot of uh, mystery and then thriller uh i like john grisham for legal thrillers and uh just finished uh, the second book in uh steeg larson's uh, millennial millennium series with uh, uh what is that elizabeth salander the girl who kicked the hornet's nest or whatever right okay i mean those type of books are, are, uh, gripping for me. Uh, but I, you know, I go by the old standbys too of, of, uh, classic fantasy and, and, uh, uh space opera to hard sci-fi. So, uh, another one of your, your fans had a question, Tracy Eddingfield. Mm-hmm. Um, Tracy wanted to know, uh, what kind of research goes into one of your writing projects? Yeah, I, I research on the fly. I know everyone's different, but uh, I'll I'll just write and uh, sort of write into the dark and um, see where the story leads me. And then if I come across something that I want to get you know more details about to make it more realistic, uh, so that I'm not totally you know unbelievable, um, then I'll do research as I go. I don't usually set it off to the side and look it up later. I'll just do a quick Google search, and that's that's all I need. I don't. I'm not going to be very detailed. I'm not going to do something that makes it sound so silly that I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail either to try to prove that I'm an expert on the, the topic. Um, 
you know, I, the complaint some people have is that, well, this wasn't, well, it's fiction, you know, it's fiction. Let, let the person just make stuff up. And if you don't like the way they make stuff up, then, you know, read a different author, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's funny. So Tracy, and then another one of your, uh, one of your readers, Mick, and I'm sorry, Mick, I'm probably going to say your last name wrong. Mick. When? When? Yeah. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> I think that's right. Is it N-G-U? Yeah, N-G-U-Y-E-N. Mm-hmm. Nick Wynn. Okay. Uh, they both kind of ask a question, and uh, they both ask a question, but it, it's all, they're both along the same lines. Um, yeah. It's basically uh, describe your writing process, and they want to know, do you already know um, the end when, you're, when, when you start? Yeah. Well, for me, I, I, like I said, I write into the dark. I don't know the ending. I don't know the beginning. I just start writing and see where it leads. To me, that's, uh, it's fun to discover where the story goes. Because when you're a reader, um, unless you are one of those who goes to the last chapter and reads that first, which I don't recommend, but a lot of people do, uh, mostly the time, you know, when you read, you're reading and you discover what's happening as you as you read. Well, I mean, that's what's fun about writing. I discover what's happening as I'm writing. What the challenge I get is, um, when I figure out the ending, when I'm about halfway through, or maybe three quarters of the way through, I realize, Oh, this is the ending and this is where it's going to end up. And, and then I get bored with it and I stop. So maybe that's my hang up. I, you know, I, I've got these stories started and I don't, I haven't finished them because in my mind I go, Oh, I see where it's going now. And I've lost sort of enthusiasm for the story. And at that point, a real writer, and I'm not a real writer, I'm just a hobby writer, but a real writer would plow through, keep going, and probably discover a lot more things than, you know, than is, uh, the story has for him, maybe a completely different ending. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but no, I don't have the ending in mind. I mean, very seldom, uh, maybe on occasion I would, but mostly I write into the dark, and then when I realize the ending is coming, uh, I see where it's coming, and then I just have to plow through until I till I get there. Um, why is it you think that the Ma Tut's Donut Hut is your your most popular story? You know, it's it's a cozy mystery, and cozy mysteries are you know mysteries typically that aren't bloody or gory. You know, the if there's a dead body, it's done off scene, off camera, uh, sort of like uh, you know what's her name, uh, Jessica Fletcher up in uh, uh, Cabot Cove, uh, murder she wrote. Uh, don't know how they. That Cabot Cove survived. I mean, there was murders every every week on television, <laughs> but uh, but you never saw the 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 actual murder. It was always you know that. So that's a cozy when when you have quirky characters and uh, and some interesting scenario, and it's not gory. It's but it's more fun natured. Um, so I but I think that's just a huge genre. And so I I liked cozies, and then I looked up. I went to Barnes and Nobles, looked for. Sh- you know, on the shelf for, you know, what about magical cats, you know, and in a, in a coffee house. And there were like 10 different series by 10 different authors with cats and bakeries and, and mysteries. I'm going, well, this is maybe, maybe this is saturated. Maybe I don't even, I thought I had something original, but again, no original ideas. Right. Right. Uh, and, uh, but I went ahead and, and it just fits that niche. So there's a, it's a huge popular, uh, niche that people enjoy, you know? And so, um, so it's been fun. It's, uh, yeah, it's a good, you know, I'm writing it for, and my target audience, and I mean, don't be offended if you fit in this, but it's really for, you know, I'm thinking of people like my mother-in-law, you know, people, uh, 50, 60, 70s in their, you know, years of age who, you know, don't want the vulgarity and just, and in, in Ma Tut's, there's not even a dead body. Well, there sort of is, but I don't want to give away what that might be. <laughs> right. Yes. I remember, uh, target one time when we had one near us um they all of a sudden got a bunch of these uh cozy mysteries and they had a whole mm-hmm. section of them um uh it's probably six seven years ago uh-huh. so i i kind of remember when these got popular um yeah I, I picked a couple up i hadn't read them yet but i did pick a couple of them up well, buy Ma Tut on the ebook. I think it's only ninety nine cents right now. Yeah, ninety nine cents. <laughs> there you go. Over at Amazon. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> um, well, here at the Legendarium, we like to end each episode with a segment that we call the Legendary Ending. <laughs> oh um, and we have you do have two fan questions left over that I'm going to throw in the Legendary Ending because it kind of goes with one of the questions that I ask. All right. um, so Mary Gessner. 
and uh, Brianna, your questions are coming up. Um, but the first question is, what songs are currently on your writing playlist? Yeah, I, I must be different. I cannot stand listening to music <laughs> when I write. I just I don't understand how people can. It's so distracting for me. Uh, so I have to have it silent, um, you know, because music to me is something you listen to and engage to. Uh, um, you know, it's not something that's usually on in the background, even in my home. I mean, I play sometimes a little music in the background, but most of the time, if I turn on a uh, a song, turn on a CD. I'm listening to the song because I want to engage with the lyrics and the, or the music. So I can't have it on while I'm writing. Otherwise I, I wouldn't be writing because you don't, you don't read a book in the background. I mean, you have to, you, you <laughs> sit down and you read a book. Right. Uh, so same with music. You don't have music in the background. You listen to music. So that's just me. Uh, <laughs> so that's long answer to your short question. You are, I think the third author um, to say they can't listen to music. Uh, I'm trying to remember the second one, but I remember the first one was Bob Williams. Um, he, uh, I haven't seen the picture yet. He says he does have one online, but he he says that he has uh, these like Husqvarna uh, headphones you put on oh, yeah. to drown out sound that he wears when he writes because he can't have yeah. any distractions when he's writing. So, yeah, good um, idea. And then a bunch of the uh, uh, surprising, a lot of authors, well, t- so it was surprising to me, but then when I hear them explain why it's, it's not, um, a lot of them listen to like soundtracks uh, that mm-hmm. are like instrumentals only. So, oh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So I, th- I believe you're episode 45. So in 45 episodes, you, you're the third person to not listen to, there you to go. music. So it's a rare crowd, but it is out. the mighty minority. That's right. <laughs> Um, uh, the second question in the legendary ending is if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, which one of your book characters would you want to be stuck with? And then why? Well, uh, yeah, I guess I'd have to go with Mac, the magical cat, you know? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this cat special, he can, he can get me out of any, any situation <laughs> <laughs> that, that works. Now, if you could pick any character from any kind of media source, books, comics, movies, television, whatever, yeah. uh, what character would you want to be stuck with and why? Oh, it'd have to be Linda Carter's wonder woman. I mean, okay. I was, I was in love with her in junior high. So I'm yeah. Just, uh, wonder woman's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about the new wonder woman. I must admit. Now that looks good. I have to admit I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I am. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I think it looks good, but I felt the same way when I saw previews for Batman versus Superman. <laughs> and it wasn't the greatest <laughs> movie ever. So I'm going in with high hopes again. I hope that I'm not let down because it looks yeah. really good, um, especially the new trailer that, that they released. Yeah. Um, this, uh, the next question is, if you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? I, I thought about this one. I can't. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would I would do. um Sort of slipstream from age to age, I would stay in one location that I think would be in uh, maybe Rome, you know, maybe you know a, a major city, and I would stay uh, sort of like um, you know uh, the time machine H.G. Wells, you know, where it goes forward in the future and, and backward. I, I would stay in that little slipstream and just watch everything change around me as the as the years peel off. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, I would I would be um, have the ability to slow people down on the freeway. Okay. That's my superpower. That's I, I'd, super- be, I'd call it, uh, what is that, the governor on a car where That's you can't, right. where they can't go fast. I would be the, the, the governator or <laughs> something because, and, uh, when people zip around me going 75 in a 60 mile an hour zone, I would just say zap them and they would have to automatically slow down and then I would pass them and wave. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's so. a that's a superpower, right there. There we go. That is a superpower. Um, and so the question that we're kind of famous for here is: a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say, and why is he here? I, I mean, this uh, you probably had forty five answers. I mean, what's red and white, and what's black and white and red all over? Right, a penguin in the sun. I guess I don't know. That's the only thing that came up with. <laughs> that works. 
And this is where Mary and Brianna's question is going to come in. They they wanted to know what kind of advice do you have uh, for an unpublished writer or a beginner? Um, and it kind of ties in with the last question that, that we ask here. And it's, before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with the listeners? Yeah, I mean, just don't do like I'm doing and stop midway. I mean, it, you just have to... Um, go ahead and experiment. Go ahead and publish. Don't rewrite your first story or book for five years. Just finish it, move on, and keep learning and growing. I mean, you can always take it down. You know, some people say, oh, if I put up a bad book, it's going to ru- ruin my reputation. It's not going to ruin your reputation. If it's a bad book, no one's going to read it. So no one will know who you are. You don't have a reputation. You know, so just go ahead and experiment. Put it up, um, get feedback, r- write a s- second story, put it up. Uh, get feedback, write a third story and don't worry about the past. Um, yeah. So that would be I uh, probably good advice for life too. Okay. There we go. Um, where can listeners go if they want to learn more about you and your books? Um, what's my website? Uh, Lyndon Perry I think, okay. uh, or Thule fog press. I also have a sort of an indie publishing arm and I publish a couple of other people's stories. Um, uh, Dave Harrington's uh, Mystic Visions and Anders Venning, uh, Non Periel, uh, are two recently published books that I put up on Tule Fog Press. So um, that would be uh, a, a place to look from all my writing and others that I've published. Okay. And um, for one final question, what can your fans expect from you in 2017? Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, yeah. Um, got family who wants me to finish a, uh, a crime novel uh, that I've written under my middle name. I have a, a third story I need to write for Joe Conrath um, in uh, his Jack Daniels universe. Uh, I've got to finish the wool stories. My second not my tut story. Uh, I've got probably 10 or 12 other stories that I have. Uh, started and are about halfway through and I need to finish. So okay. if I, um, if I ever get uh, the mojo going, uh, I could probably publish, you know, 20, 20 books this year, but uh-huh. I mean, that won't happen. So don't hold your breath. <laughs> that works. Well, we will put links to your uh, sites over in the show notes over at legendarium.com. Awesome. Thank you for coming on and doing 30 minute author interviews. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Preston. Appreciate it. Well, everybody, that is all the time we've got for this episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. We hope you come back every Wednesday for a brand new author interview. And don't forget to head on over to legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, you'll find the giveaway we've talked about where Lyndon Perry is giving three people the chance to pick out an ebook copy of any of the books that he has written. And anybody that signs up for his newsletter also can get a free ebook copy of any of his short stories. All that can be found in the show notes. You can also find the link to our sponsors, Serial Box and the Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. Check them out and let them know that you heard about them right here on 30 Minute Author Interviews. And we'd also like to thank a few of our Patreon subscribers. We would like to thank Nick Breaker, Diane S. Loftus, third scribe and maggie stewart grant they are supporting 30 minute author interviews through patreon and they're also receiving the very special patreon only podcast called 10 questions with so visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30 minute author interviews as well until next time stay legendary the legendary 30 minute author interviews. I almost had it in one take.